Namaste. So in this video, I want to finish up the first Adhyaya, the first chapter of the Upanishad, and talk about a little bit about how Nachiketa actually conquers death and how he does it. And then in the next video, we'll talk a little more about Adhyatma Yoga and the meaning of the Upanishad as a whole. So in the previous video, we talked about verse 20. This doubt that arises consequent on the death of a man, some saying it exists and others saying it does not exist. Astitye ke nayamastitichayke. Huh? I would know this under your instruction. This is the third of all the boons. So Nachiketa drops the bomb. He wants the ultimate knowledge. And not from anybody, but from death. And really what he's saying is, death, I want to know your secret. Does the living entity exist after death? Or is he just blown away and then there's nothing? And of course, <laughs> Both extremes are wrong. <laughs> and we'll see how this all works out. Um, because I don't want to get into the whole explanation here. I want to go through the verses to the end of the chapter and then discuss the meaning. So after hearing this, death replies, With regard to this, even the gods entertain doubts in days of yore. For being subtle, this substance, the self, is not easily comprehended. O oh, Nachiketa, ask for some other boon. Do not press me. Give up this boon that is demanded of me. So death is pleading with Nachiketa. Huh? Don't make me give up my secret. Don't make me give you this ultimate knowledge that even the gods have trouble with. Because then, you know, I'll have to reveal all my secrets and empower your understanding to gain the ultimate knowledge. And that's something we don't like to give the mortals. <laughs> we immortals want to keep this for ourselves. But Nachiketa retorts, Even the gods entertain doubt with regard to this? And, oh, death... Since you too say that it is not well comprehended, and since another instructor of this like you is not to be had, therefore there is no other boon comparable to this one. This is the ultimate boon. This is the ultimate benediction. But death is not so easily convinced that Nachiketa is qualified to receive this knowledge. Because after all, if even the gods had trouble with it, it requires a very high qualification. So he tempts him. He tests him. Listen. Ask for sons and grandsons that will be centurions. Ask for many animals, elephants, and gold, and horses, and a vast expanse of the earth. And you yourself live for as many years as you like. If you think some other boon to be equal to this... Ask for that. Ask for wealth and long life. You become ruler over a vast region. I will make you fit for the enjoyment of all delectable things. Whatever things there be that are desirable but difficult to get, pray for all those cherished things according to your choice. Here are these women with chariots and musical instruments. Such are not surely to be had by mortals. With these who are offered by me, you get yourself served. O oh, Nachiketa, do not inquire about death. <laughs> these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> He's trying to pull the Jedi mind trick on Nachiketa by offering all these things. I mean, what a setup death has. He can offer just about anything. And we'll discuss what that means in terms of consciousness after we finish these verses.
Nachiketa replies, O oh death, ephemeral are these, and they waste away the vigor of all the senses that a man has. All life, without exception, is short indeed. Let the vehicles be yours alone. Let the dances and songs remain yours. Man is not to be satisfied with wealth. Now that we have met you, we shall get wealth. We shall live as long as you will rule it. But the boon that is worth praying for by me is that alone. Having reached the proximity of the undecaying immortals, what decaying mortal who dwells on this lower region, the earth, but knows of higher goals, will take delight in a long life while conscious of the worthlessness of music, disport, and the joy thereof. O oh, death, tell us of that thing about which people entertain doubt in the context of the next world, and whose knowledge leads to a great result. Apart from this boon, which relates to the inscrutable thing, Nachiketa does not pray for any other. So Nachiketa stands firm, and because of this, he conquers death. Well, how is that? How can a mere mortal conquer an immortal like death? And the answer has to do with what death is. Okay, so let's look into the structure of death. Death is characterized in Shankaracharya's purports here as being desire, ignorance, and action. In other words, one is ignorant of the real truth about life. He thinks that the world is real. He thinks that the body is the self. He thinks that life is his to enjoy. And so he desires all these enjoyable things, wealth, women, land, animals, gold, you know, so many things. But all these things are useless because they disappear at the end of the body. So Nachiketa doesn't want anything temporary. He wants the real thing. He wants that which never passes away. And that's knowledge. Enlightenment, specifically. Not ordinary knowledge, but realized knowledge, jnana. And so we'll get into this uh, in the next chapters. The next five chapters deal with this in great detail and great clarity because death really is the greatest teacher. And why is that? Well, what actually happens after death, you know, there's all kinds of stories about the Yama Dudas drag you away to Yama Loka and then you're judged and thrown into hell and all of these, you know, horror stories about death. But what is death really? Experientially, it means entering into sushupti. And sushupti consciousness, we have discussed extensively since back in the Mandukya Upanishad series. Sushupti means the void, emptiness. That space in which one is conscious, but there are no objects to be conscious of. Now, when you enter sushupti, you bring with you the seed of your future existence, which is the essence, like a, like a compressed archive, of all the impressions and actions and feelings and ideas that you have in your previous life. Whether it's just the day or the whole life, huh? entering into sushupti means you bring with you this bag of thoughts and purposes, really, intentions, because sushupti is intelligence. Vijnana. That's the vijnana kosha. So, when you enter into sushupti, there is nothing. What's going to happen to a person who is not prepared, who is not realized, who is not ready? Well, they're going to desire all these different things, isn't it? Well, I want a body, I want a world, I want a life, I want to enjoy, I want this and that and the other thing. And so they start dreaming about these things, but because they're in sushupti, and sushupti is total causation, 
Whatever purposes one dreams about while in Sushupti certainly take place. They certainly happen. Now, if one enters Sushupti with evil purposes, the desire to hurt others, to exploit, to consume, then one has to go into a hellish experience where one experiences being the object of those desires. But if one enters Sushupti only with a desire for knowledge and elevation, then one can take a very high birth, either in the heavenly planets or even the Svarga. Huh? A Svarga in the Upanishads doesn't mean the lower heavenly planets. It means the Divyaloka, the divine world, the world of the immortals. So one can actually pass to the world of the immortals if one's purpose is pure. Now, Nachiketa has shown he doesn't hold any desire for the lower things. He doesn't even want to be a demigod or anything like that. He just wants to know what is the secret of death. And so death is going to have to, <laughs> because he gave his promise, huh? he's bound by his promise to reveal all these things, and he does in the succeeding chapters. And like I said, in the next video, we're going to give an overview of that knowledge so that you can have that as background context going into the next chapters. But what's important here is that by his uh, refusal to accept the temptations, in other words, by his rejection of all these material desires, he avoids any kind of suffering, any kind of hellish existence, any kind of punishment by death. He actually leaves the sphere of death's influence, of his power, because death can only mess with us if we are in ignorance. If we have knowledge, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. If we have that knowledge, even if it's only theoretical, death has no power over us. Because we know, no matter what happens, I will exist. The existence, the consciousness, and the joy of Brahman is simply reflected in these material things. They don't actually have it. And we'll get into that in the next video in detail. But what I want to get to here is that death can be conquered. And death is conquered by knowledge. Knowledge here means to give up these desires for temporary material things. Because the whole world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. In other words, we are Atma. We are the perceiver, the watcher, the seer, Drik. Huh? And the world and objects are the scene, Drishya. Anything that is different from the seer, in other words, the scene, is not self. By definition, I'm the self. So whatever I see that is different from me, and that includes the material body, mind, and so on, is not the self. So because it's not self, it's not Brahman. It doesn't have the properties of Brahman, which are eternal existence, uh, sat, consciousness, chit, and bliss, ananda. The apparent existence, the apparent uh, qualities, you know, beautiful qualities and so on, and even the apparent consciousness of, for example, the material body, are simply borrowed. They actually belong to Brahman. And this is what we're going to discuss in the next video on the principles of Adhyatma Yoga, which is the theme of this entire Upanishad. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>